Hello everyone and welcome to the video. So in the last video, we went over all the fundamental concepts of the f -sharp programming language. And we didn't really see what an, uh, an example application could look like in f -sharp. And in this video, I want to rectify that because it can be very difficult to visualize how to structure your application in a new uh, programming paradigm like the, the functional programming. Uh, it can be very hard to imagine what to put where, how should you organize your code. And so in this video, we're going to take a very simple program, uh, Fizzbuzz, in this example, and we're going to add a few constraints to it. And with those constraints, it will enable us to actually have a conversation about how to design your application in a functional paradigm. Now, normally Fizzbuzz, if you're not familiar with it, it's a very simple program and has a few rules. So the goal of the application is to print all numbers between one and 100 to the screen. But there are a few exceptions. If three is a factor of that number, we want to print fizz instead. If five is a factor of the number, we want to print buzz instead of the number. And if it's a factor of both three and five, we want to print fizz buzz instead of the number. So let's say for one to 20, it should look uh, something like this. So it should be one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, and so on. I'll print one to 20 on the screen, but it's very simple. Now the program itself is super simple. I mean, you can write it as one function and it doesn't really require any user input or any input from the outside world. So there's no validation to do. There's no risk of, of bad data and uh, the function itself is deterministic, so it'll always return the same output. And so adding a few requirements to this problem will actually make it look a lot more like a real world software application. In order to make this a bit more interesting, we're gonna add these four tiny requirements. So the first requirement is the console is gonna ask the user for a number. And so we're gonna have that in interaction with the outside world, which is gonna make it a, bit, a little bit more interesting. And we're gonna have the potential of bad data. So that's one factor. The second requirement is if the input is not an integer, we want to print out a specific message to the screen, like whatever input was, is not a valid integer. The third requirement is if the number, the integer, is not between one and 4,000, we want to print out, hey, you entered this number, but it's not between one and 4,000. So we want a very, we want to only allow those numbers in that range. What this will do is it will create another layer of validation. So the first one is parsing and this, this one is validation based on our super secret uh, business rules that we want to have. And lastly, once we have that validated number, we want to do the FizzBuzz program with the lower bound being one, and the upper bound being whatever number the user inputted. So let's say he inputs 20. Uh, we want the FizzBuzz program to go from one to 20. We don't want to do one to 100 like the traditional pro, uh, problem itself. Now with these four requirements, it doesn't really sound that much more complicated, but there's a twist. We're actually not only gonna do one implementation of this, we're gonna do two implementations. So the first one is gonna be like a very YOLO style guerrilla mode. We're just gonna write it all in one function in the main function, and then uh, we're just gonna leave it like that. So it's gonna be very basic, basically how anyone would write a script or maybe someone that's new to, to software and doesn't really know how to do stuff, we're just gonna write it all in one function. From there, the second implementation will be a live refactoring. So we're gonna take that you know, big main function and then break it up make it modular, make it testable, add some tests, and we're gonna very, we're gonna decouple a lot of the logic there. We will do this by following the best practices of software design. And mainly there's a few things we want to achieve with this. The first one is we want to decouple the parsing logic, the validation logic, and the algorithm itself. We want all those three to be decoupled from the application. So each of those can be unit tested. Secondly, we want the input and the output mechanism to be abstracted out from that application flow. So we don't necessarily want to be coupled to the console input. Maybe in the future we want a different kind of input, maybe a, uh, a web interface or a website or something. 
below that kind of thing. So we don't want to have coupled our input and output mechanism. Thirdly, in that same vein, we want to follow a more of an onion architecture where if you're familiar with software design, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, I'll throw up a graph on the screen. Basically, the onion architecture uh, helps you organize how you place your logic. So there's logic that's more at the infrastructure level, which is in this case, the console or the, the, the web application. Uh, it's how the application will be delivered or how, how messages from the application will be delivered to the domain logic. And the domain logic is more the business rules and the actual uh, use case itself and what you're trying to accomplish. We're not gonna go super in depth, but we're gonna follow that, that path and we're gonna discuss why it's so important to follow a certain layer like this. Lastly, we're gonna follow F-sharp coding conventions. So how we organize our modules, what they're called, how should we call our methods, a lot more of the clean code aspect of writing code, which is naming, spaces, how things are formatted. Doing this will enhance your code's readability and maintainability, which are key factors when working with a team, working with long living software that will be maintained for years to come. So it's very important to go through those uh, conventions. Now we're just about to jump on the computer and get started with the video. If you like this kind of content, make sure you stay subscribed to the channel and leave the video a like if you appreciate it. It really helps me out. So without a further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right, welcome back. So we're at the computer now and we will create a new solution for our project. And I'm gonna create a console application to start. So this will basically be called uh, FizzBuzz. And for this first implementation, I will use a slightly different name for the project name because we're going to be adding more projects when we're going to do the refactoring. So for now, I'm going to just call it uh, Gorilla. Because it's like Gorilla mode, it's kind of like just going in and doing whatever. So that's pretty good. Okay, this looks good. So we're going to create this. Now we have a program.fs file and we're basically gonna write it in here for now. We're just gonna go ahead and write it all. And I made sure to have a bigger font this time because there's a few people asking me about that. So thanks for the feedback. And we're gonna go ahead and start. So basically the flow will be, we'll print out and ask for a, a number to do the fizzbuzz we'll get the input from the user with the console read line, we'll parse, we'll validate the number, we'll execute the algorithm, and we'll print out the result. That's basically what the flow will look like. And for now, we're not doing anything fancy with architecture or anything like that. We're just gonna write it all quick and easy. And from there, we'll take a step back and look at how we can improve the, the quality of the software in, in means of modularity and, and testability because it's not going to be testable at all in this first iteration. Well, except you know, manually, of course. So initially we have to ask the user for a number. So we can, we already have print FN here because when you create a new uh, console application, it gives you a hello world file. So we can just keep that file, keep it going. And I'm going to ask the user, please enter a valid integer between one and 4,000. Good. You can do colon here. And to get the input, we're gonna do console.readline, which is from .NET, if uh, you didn't know about it. And if you ever, you know, for questions like that, Stack Overflow in Google, you know, like any other language, will help you out with those easy questions of what to use in .NET if you're new to .NET. Um, so we can go input is equal to that. All right. Now we have the input. We can go ahead and try to parse it. And for that, there's the int32.tryparse method. Um, so we can go int32. 
32.try parse. There's also parse, which throws an exception, but you know, if we have the choice, we don't want to do the uh, the exception. If we can just do try the try method, uh, ideally we don't deal as much with exceptions. Uh, in C sharp or in any other language, maybe exceptions are a valid way to do things or they're an idiomatic way to do things but not necessarily in f-sharp so let's stick to the try methods as much as we can so we're going to try parse the input and with the result of this if we look at the signature it says has type bool it's a tuple of bool and int uh, you see has type bool asterisk int so it's a, a tuple of bool and int but can we do that we can go ahead and pattern match on the result so we can do match with oh, match this with, and then in the first case, let's go with the error case first. Um, because in this case, this big expression, this big function will actually return unit. And uh, ideally I prefer having the, the quick exits first, just in this case, because we're just gonna slam everything in, in one function. It doesn't really matter to be honest. For me, I just feel it's more readable that way. So we can do false, which is if the parse was successful or not. So in a case that it's not successful, we don't really care about the number and we can print to the screen, uh, printfn. And actually we do care about the number because we want to give, we want to give a message to, we want to um, add that string to the message for the user. So we can go ahead and do percentage s for string is not a valid integer. Then we can pass um, the x. And here it says, oh, uh, x is actually an int. So we can do this. But we know actually, since the int won't be initialized to that input, we want to print out the input itself. So we want s, but we want to print out the input by the user. So that's good. Oh. Okay. So in this case, we don't need the x. Now in the true case, uh, we can call it number. What do you want to do with the number? The next thing we want to do is we want to make sure the number is between one and 4,000. So how can we do that? Well, we can use another pattern match to do that. So I'm um, gonna hop on a new line and we can do match number. And not, not only can we do match number, we can actually do the conditional. So we're gonna basically do an if statement, but we're gonna do it for a match expression. So we can do if one is smaller or equal to number, and number is smaller or equal than 4,000 with. So that's the way I like to write it. I like to have, if I'm gonna validate that a number is between two bounds, I like having the, the bounds on the outside and a number on the inside. It helps me visualize a lot more, which is a little like the quick, these quick little adjustments that improve readability, I feel are kind of important. So just mentioning that. And in this case, if it's false, then we're gonna print out um, you entered uh, number, please enter a valid number. Please enter a number, it's fine, because I already entered a valid number. Please enter a number between one and 4,000. Then we can pass the number here. All right, good. So that's in the false case. In the true case, now we can go ahead and write the actual fizzbuzz method. For starters, we can generate a new collection for all numbers between one and the number. We can do that with the range operator. So we'll work with lists. Uh, you could use sequences here, uh, but we haven't talked about sequences yet, so I'm not gonna work with sequences for now. So we can go ahead and do between one and number. 
So now it's saying it's red because it's supposed to earn return unit, but we don't have to worry for that for now. It's just a pre, you know, a, a type checking uh, error. So between those numbers, for each of those numbers, I want to get the remainders of of the factor division. So basically, normally if you've done FizzBuzz before, you, you check the module of three. If it's equal to zero, then it's a then the number has three as a factor, and you do the same thing for five. So we can go ahead and do for each for each number. Let's go ahead and get the module of three and the module of five. So how we can do that is we can go list dot map, and we can pass in a function here with the number. And we can go ahead and return a tuple of n modulo 3 and n modulo 5. Oh, I'm going to call this n. I feel it's more intuitive. OK. So this compiles. The red line is still the same error, so don't worry about it. And for each of these, we can go ahead and do pattern matching on every row and check with the different patterns what is this the string we actually have to output so if we go ahead and list.map and notice how much we're using list.map uh, just for now map is basically your best friend map and piping uh, are really used for really useful methods so we can go to list.map and here as an example normally we do fun and and then if you want to pattern match then we can do uh, match and with and then start pattern matching but instead of doing this instead of doing fun and match and with we can actually do a function here so we can directly write the word function oh my bar was not in the good uh, place here and so if we don't need the n in scope we can actually just go ahead and uh, use the function keyword. <coughs> so what, it was, what, what will this look like? Well, in the first case, if both of the modules are equal to zero, so if it's zero comma zero, we know that it's a factor of 15 or a factor of both. And that means that number should be replaced with the word fizzbuzz. Similarly, if it's a factor of three, but not a factor of five, we know we have to replace it with the word fizz. And I'm gonna do the same for the five. So if it's not zero, and it'll, we know it's not gonna be zero because it would have matched the early two cases on the top. So sequencing your patterns is a good idea, or not only a good idea, it's necessary. So really, we have to think through which patterns are, are like the higher priority. It's basically kind of ordering your if statements sometimes. You know, sometimes you want to order your if statements uh, because some, some pieces of data will match multiple branches and you want to prioritize some branches. So that's basically that. So if the module of five is buzz, uh, sorry, if the module of five is equal to zero, we want buzz. And if it's anything else, so we can discard here, then we want the number. We want to put the number itself. But here, you know, I don't have the number in scope. I don't have it here. And in my last mapping, or in my last map, we, we kind of lost the data of n because we used these two, uh, these two tuples, and uh, these two uh, data points instead. So in order to make this work, there's a few things we can do. The, the easiest suggestion is we can include n in the tuple here. So now we can do the pattern matching and include the n like this. And in this case, we want to put n in scope and we don't care about those other two numbers. And we want to stringify the n, stringify the n, do n to string. 
so basically we have a collection of strings and we want to concatenate them all together to make one big string. So there's a lot of ways we can do that. We can do it with uh, S print F, which is uh, string interpolation. Um, there's a lot of other ways we can do fold, but uh, performance wise, the best option would probably be using string.concat, which takes a separator and it takes a sequence of strings. So we still get the error message because everything else is unit and we have string here, but this compiles. So now that we have our big string, we want to print out to the screen basically. That's the only thing we want to do. So we can pipe this into printf and and we can do here is the output and maybe include a new line here. I'm going to do percentage S and now everything compiles because I'm piping the result of my concatenation into the printing function and the printing function returns unit. So this is actually the code, the totality of our application. I'm going to open up the terminal. And right now, workspace is fizzbuzz. I'm at the root of the project. I want to go into my, my um, console application path, and I call it .gorilla. Still like that name. Um, go .net run, which will build and run my code. OK. So please enter a valid integer between 1 and 4,000. Let's try to add a invalid integer. And uh, it says as, as, as is not a valid integer. So that's exactly what we want. Now let's try to run it again. But we want to add a valid integer, but not an integer between 1 and 4,000. So we can go ahead and enter you know, minus 1. Okay, great. It says you entered minus one, please enter a number between one and 4,000. So that's great. Now we can actually try our FizzBuzz implementation and maybe we can write 20. Okay. So this looks pretty good. Um, we have a space here. Oh, this is why. Now that I've removed that space, it should be pretty good, but I'm not going to run it again because it's, you know, it's basically fine. So we have one, two, fizz, because you can buy three by three, four, five, buzz, six, fizz. So it's pretty good. And 15 is our first fizz buzz. And then the sequence restarts. So that's great. We implemented a very simple version. And even with this, we, we saw a lot of concepts. We saw using the unit type. We saw pattern matching, um, using the print. We saw uh, using the uh, one of the higher order functions, which is list.map. Um, so we, we saw a lot of concepts, just a little bit of code. But now we want to look at, you know, how do we build an application? How use, using this very simple problem, how do we structure the application itself? So let's go ahead and start refactoring. Now, the first thing I want to do is I really want to identify what the units are. What, what are the pieces that are unit testable itself that I really want to decouple from the application and that should go in their own module. And what I, from what I can see, there's three units I really want to, to separate. There's the parsing logic here. So I want the parsing logic to be decoupled and to be honest, parsing normally, you know, it's not a logically intensive operation that there's going to be different implementations. You're basically always going to be using uh, the, inst the, the, the try parse method. Of course, you can use like regex or something or regex, but it doesn't, there's no value for now. Let's assume it's some more complicated unit for the example. I'm using a simple example because I don't want to focus on the implementation details. I want to focus on the, the structure of the application itself. So that can be our first unit. The second unit is the validation. We can decouple that and we can, let's say we don't know 
what validation we want. If there's other rules, we can stick it in, we can stick it in its own unit and write unit tests for that. And then lastly, we have a nice unit here that is the actual fizzbuzz algorithm. So with that set, we can go ahead and we can create a class library because the other objective of this software design is we want to decouple the use case, the application use case from the input mechanism, the input output mechanism. So in this case, the input output mechanism is the console and we don't want to stain our application with details of how input will be going into the application now output will be going out so what we'll do is we'll create a class library and we'll put our application logic there and we'll create a new project that's fizzbuzz.cli which it will contain definitions of the implementations of the input and output functions and that's how we're going to decouple the input and output mechanism with the rest of the application flow so let's get started. Let's go ahead and create a new project. So I'm gonna add new project and here I'm going to select a class library. And if you don't know what the difference between a class library and a console application is, is the output itself. So a class library, when we build it, it will generate a DLL, which is a dyna dynamically linked library. And it's a library of code where you can include in other projects to, to, uh, to use its modules, its classes, its functions. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have a good idea of what that is if you're using another programming language. So it's a, a library that's linked at runtime. So uh, you can build against it at, at compile time, but it's loaded at, at runtime. So it's not a static library, it's a dynamic library. And a console application, it will generate a .exe. So it'll generate an executable. So we usually use those for programs itself, and our logic usually goes into DLLs. That's how it, it, it basically goes. All right, so we can call this fizzbuzz. Just plain fizzbuzz is fine because all our fizzbuzz logic will go there. You can call it something else, .shared if you want, but I'm just gonna call it fizzbuzz for now. We have a file library. That's basically what it comes with. And the first thing I wanna do is I want to create the modules we just mentioned. So we have a parser module I'm just gonna leave this for now. So we have a parser module that we talked about and we have a validation module. Or if we want to follow the same naming conventions, it can be the validator module because I call it parser, I didn't call it parsing, whatever, little detail. And let's start with this for now. So the first thing we want to do is we can copy over this logic that we had here. So what the, what will this function look like? And is the font size, oh, the font is not good. Here's the font, all right. Hopefully you can see that all right on all devices. And what we can do here is we can go and write our parsing method. So the parse method, let parse, and we have an input. This will be equal to, we can pass it into n32.tryparse input. Now it needs the system namespace. So we can alt enter and import missing namespaces. Now here, there's a unique overload and since this is a more of a C-sharp implementation where it has uh, parameter overloading, so, or method signature overloading. And what that means is it has a lot of time with the time inference, the type inference, to figure out what input is. Because we give it to a function that has different overloads and it's really hard to determine. So we're gonna give the compiler a little bit of help and we're gonna annotate this and say it's a string. So now it's nice and happy. And you see now it returns a bool and int, or a bool and int. 
But this is really a, you know, an F-sharp friendly return type. This uh, bool slash, uh, a bool int tuple or a bool whatever tuple is a perfect opportunity to use the option type. So what we can do is we can actually pattern match on this. And if it's a, if it's false, or whatever, we can do none. And if it's, oh, if it's true and a number, we can do some number. Now our signature is string to int option, which is perfect. So we can pattern match on the int option and we can figure out whether the parsing worked or not. And the signature is very F sharp friendly. So that's really great. Another way we could have done this is with active patterns, but I didn't talk about active patterns yet, so we're not gonna use that, but it will be coming the, the active patterns. Uh, it's basically composable pattern matches, if you can think about it either, like customizable pattern matches, which is really cool. We'll be looking at that in a subsequent tutorial video, which will be covering a lot more of the F-sharp concepts. Uh, for now, we're not gonna talk about it. One thing that, you know, this, this is obviously overdoing it, but just to picture what you, could, what you could do, this is a very popular thing to do uh, in F-sharp, to uh, convert a bool something tuple into an option, because the bool something tuple is a very automatic way of doing safe operations in uh, C-sharp. So we're gonna be using this a lot more and it's a gen you know, we can make it generic and can use it from there. So what, one thing we can do is we can create a, a option module and notice I'm using the word option, which is exactly the same name as the option module for all of its other functions, like the bind that we saw, the map, and there's, you won't see a discrimination between where the modules are coming from. So it's a good idea to write module option if you want to add like basically extension methods, if you want to the option uh, module or the, to the option type. So here we can do let from, and I'm gonna call it a try tuple since I feel that's the best way to describe uh, a bool and whatever tuple. And this is gonna be equal to function. Um, and we can actually just copy this. Okay, and we're not gonna call it number because we're gonna call it, it's not necessarily a number in our implementation. So it's just gonna be X. All right. Great, and from here we can just use it by doing option dot from try tuple. And for common library methods or common library modules, we usually put the annotation require qualified access. What this will do is we'll require uh, the caller of the method to prepend the module name before the method. And the reason why we do that is there's a lot of methods like map, bind, uh, filter, and stuff like that that are common in more, in, in a lot more modules than, they're, they're common in a lot of modules. And it's a good idea to prefix the module name beforehand to give a little bit more information. So to force the caller to do that, we can require qualified access. That's a brief summary. All right, so now we have our little module here with a good signature. Now let's move on to the validation. One thing I like to mention, one last thing I like to mention with this parser method is its name. Normally, when we have a option returning or when it can succeed or not, we want to use a, a specific uh, prefix. We can call it try parse basically like the N32 version. So we can try parse and this documents that it will return an option or it might, it, it won't throw, it probably won't throw because normally with the try prefix, it doesn't throw. It returns 
a conditional value or a value that can be good or not. Now moving on to validation, let's start by writing exactly what we had beforehand. So if you do a validate, and this is kind of, I just said we can use the, uh, the try prefix, but saying try validate is kind of weird. We can do try get valid number. Try get valid number, okay, we can probably do that. We could have done validate, but having the try prefix is kind of nice. Try get valid number. This will be, this will take a number in and we're going to pattern match on the number basically like we did in uh, here. Always mix those two up and we're going to remove this because it's not of this method's concern. This method's concern is to validate the number and we can return an option as well. It's either a valid number or it's not. So we can go ahead and do if this is false, we can return none. And if it's true, we can return some number. So this will document that the return value here is a valid number. But there's one thing that, that I don't like about this is that here we have the opportunity to put the number, the, the parse number, and we can tag it or document it as a valid number in the future so that another function somewhere else can take a valid number type and it doesn't have to revalidate that number. You'll see what I mean in a few moments. So we won't do it for now, but we'll add it when we do the FizzBuzz algorithm, which is basically coming up next because we did the validation, we did the parsing. Now all we have to do is the uh, algorithm itself. So I'm going to do module fizzbuzz and we're going to just copy this. We should probably put it in a method though. So we're going to do let get fizzbuzz string with a number passed in and now we can just add the tab and this works fine. We get the number and we get the string. But here, here is what I mean. We accept an int here. So int can be any number. It could be an invalid int. Someone can call this with an invalid int. And ideally, we don't want that. Having a, a bounded number type in the input here will reduce the amount of unit tests that need to be done on this function. Because otherwise, you have to test what the result is with minus 1, with uh, 4,500, which are two numbers that will never get called in our application workflow. Like we saw in the gorilla mode, there's no way that this will get called with a number that's not between one and 4,000. But that doesn't really get translated here. So that's a problem. But we do have a solution for it, which is very nice. And this is using single case discriminated unions and using a private constructor. I did not talk about the fact that constructors of discriminating unions can be made private, but you'll see it here first. So in this module, I can create a type of a private constructor and this method will basically construct a valid number object and return that instead of an integer. So let's go ahead and do it. Type valid number of oh, equals to valid number of int. All right. Now this is a public constructor, but we can go ahead and do private beforehand. This will make it so only this module can create an instance of it. But there's a downside that also means that this module can only also be the only one to deconstruct it. So we have to pair it with a function to deconstruct the uh, to deconstruct the valid number. But that's a small cost versus a lot of advantages that it actually brings. So normally for me, it does. I don't mind too much. So we have this private validation of int. So right here, what we can do is we can go valid number oh, of number. Now this returns an int to valid number option. 
So it can either be a valid number or it can also not. Now here, instead of a, an integer, what we can do is we can take a valid number. So normally what we would do is we do valid number here. And now we can open validator, to be honest. But it says the union cases or field types, private number are not accessible from this code location. They're not accessible because of the private keyword. See here? So they're not valid. So, so it's not accessible. But what we can do is we can do um, a function and we can put it in a module called valid number. So it appears as though it's a static method. We can do valid number and we can do let value is equal to, um, actually we can just deconstruct here. Valid, valid number number and then we can return number great so now we can pass in a valid number and see here how because f sharp is a statically uh, sorry it's a type inferred language or it's a language where the types are inferred naming variables becomes even more important uh, to read and to avoid needing to put type annotations so try to be very precise when you use variable names. If they're temporary like this, it doesn't really matter. You know, I use N for numbers, S for strings, or stuff like that. Uh, I don't believe that's super important here, but let's say for your higher level functions, that's, that's pretty key. And so now we can do valid number dot value and pass it to number here. Keep in mind, this can also be done with active patterns but we haven't seen active patterns yet. So see two, two key use cases of active patterns that we could have used. So now our get fizzbuzz string takes a valid number instead. So it will, it will, this basically makes it so this function cannot fail. There's no way that this function can fail because in order to construct a valid number, we need a number between one and 4,000. Now we know our function will not fail because it gets a valid number in input. All right, we're just about to get ready to move on. Uh, there's two small things I want to change. The first thing is I really don't like this method name. So I'm gonna call it uh, is valid. Uh, I feel it documents pretty well. Or if we can do is valid number. So it's, it's still good because it's a conditional. So in, in the method name, it asks where it says it might not be uh, valid or not. And the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to move this and move it to the valid number module. So this will, we have the constructor and the deconstructor in the same module. And I think that's important just to have it in the, in the right place. Now we're ready to glue stuff together in our domain, in our domain service, if you want. If uh, we can recall the, the uh, onion layer, we have domain uh, entities and functions and we can build domain services. So we're still in the kind of business rules sphere of, of concerns. So we don't have to really worry about the, uh, the use cases and what messages to print to the console just yet we can just focus on what the possible values are and what the possible outputs of this workflow are. All right, so I'm gonna create a module and call it module domain. And here we're gonna have a, a, an execute function. With the execute function, I'm gonna glue the three modules together. So we can do let execute. We want to decouple the three units from the application workflow. So in object oriented, what you would do is each of the modules and each of the, yeah, each of the modules will have an interface and the workflow will use, will take in an interface of each. So an interface of the parser, uh, a validator interface and a fizzbuzz interface. And then its logic will call uh, methods on the interfaces instead of the of the concrete classes. In functional programming, the basic unit of 
let's say abstraction, the basic, the way we abstract stuff from the implementation is with function signatures. So it's much like, you know, back in the, the C days where you wrote a header file and the header file had, uh, it had different uh, function signatures. That's basically what we're doing here is we're, the way that we are decoupling those is with the function signature. So even before we write this function, we can write our interfaces, if you will. And the way we do that is by creating types. So types can be functions, function types can be real types as well. So we can use abbreviations for this case. We can also use you know, rat single case discriminating unions for these, but it's not necessary. We can just use type abbreviations. So let's say I'll have a type that's called parse number. And I want this to be a string that, that will result. So parse number will take a string and will return the int option. The other thing we can do is for validator, validate number can be a int and return a valid number option and we'll open validator here. So it's a valid number option. That's the third thing. And then the third thing is we can do uh, do fizzbuzz or we can call it get fizzbuzz string. This will be equal to a, you take, give it a valid number and I'll return a string. Now we're perfectly documenting what functions we want to ask. You see, this isn't even the end of what we can do here. And the reason I say that is because when we're going to execute our domain logic or domain function, we want, we don't want the results to be options, right? For this specific application, it's error types are very important for how they will be handled in the presentation layer or how it would be handled for by the, the application itself, what, what it wants to write or what messages it wants to communicate to the, to the presentation. So even before that, it's gonna be important. So a way that we can do that or a way we can give errors, better error messages to whoever wants it is with the result type and modeling uh, errors in our domain. If we write, our high level, our high level uh, function signature for this domain service, we can say that it is uh, execute fizzbuzz workflow or something. And we can say that this will take a string and return a result, which we've seen previously of domain error. Now this domain error uh, type does not exist. And first, that's actually not correct. We want a result of string and domain error because if it's valid, we want the string of the fizzbuzz. And if it's not valid, we want a, an error. So this domain error doesn't exist because we haven't created it yet. So we can do type domain error. And for now, we can just say that we don't know what it is for now, so we're just gonna put an exception there. This is actually a, an abbreviation for the word exception. I don't believe I mentioned it in the last video. Um, so the, the system.exception. And when I write this, I'm just saying that it's, you know, it's undefined, basically. It's undefined for now, we didn't define it. But we can define what our domain errors are. We, we know that ahead of time. We know that there's one case where we input not a number where the input's not a number, and that's in the parsing region. And we know that there's another case where we input a, an invalid integer, which is in the validation part of the, of the workflow. So right out of those two, we can actually start building what our domain error type will be, will look like. So in the parsing domain, in the parsing like subdomain, if you want, uh, so we go parser error, we know that there's going to be at least one error that's going to be called not a number. And it's going to take a string. 
because it's going to be the input, right? So we can create a new type, an indiscriminated union that has a constructor. So as one case, for now there's one case of par parser error, and it's when you input not a number. Uh, the second case I mentioned for the validation, so I can go validator error, uh, and we can do invalid number because the number that we input is invalid. So we can do invalid number of int. Good. So now that we have our two numbers here, we can actually start building our domain errors. So our domain error will either be a parser error of parser error, or it's going to be a validator error of validator error. Now, it's, it's hard to say if it's best practice or not. I feel it's best practice to have uh, the same name here uh, of like what type of error it is and what's the type of error. It just makes sense. If the namings are good, the cases of the high level error type will reflect, uh, each of the cases will reflect its type that it takes in the constructor. It's not a 100% always rule. I just feel at least in this case, it makes sense. And it, it really depicts what type of error it is and what type of domain it is. And since each of these errors, so this error type represents all errors in a specific domain. And this error represents all errors of all types of domain. So each case represents an error for its domain. So it just makes sense that those two names are the same. But I can, I can see exceptions to that rule. So it's not a golden rule. It's just a rule of thumb. So I wouldn't be too worried for that for now. I think we can move on. So now all our type signatures, they all make sense. We have these functions that, we'll that we will use. With all of those, we will use this execute function and it will have an error type and the errors are listed here. So let's go ahead and write that function. Let execute. And here we can go ahead and take our dependencies. We can put our dependencies here. So we're going to have parse number. We're going to have validate number. And we're going to have get fizz buzz string. And to help us to make sure everything compiles, now, now that we wrote out all of the types of all of the parts, we can actually use those types as type as uh, type annotations. So we can do parse number is going to be a parse number, uh, parse number. This is going to be a validate number. And this is going to be a, what is it called? Get this buzz string. For the sake of this video, because my font is freakishly large, I'm going to put these on different line, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend to do that. It's just to help read for now. And all of this, all of this method, it will return an execute fizzbuzz workflow. So with this function, we'll return a new function. This is the best way of documenting a, a function type is to actually you, what, you, what you can do because this type annotation, it'll expect the execute, uh, the execute function to be to return a function because we're saying that its expression will return this, which is a function itself. So the way we usually do that is we you do fun, and you go with that. So you create a function definition and you return a lambda expression. So I can do fun input here. And just to test, I can do OK this. And this compiles. So that's what we want. It takes an input and returns a result. So we know the, at least for now, I believe the type signature is fine. So now what we do, we have an input. 
we can go ahead and put it into parser number. So we can do input parser number. Now it says it's expecting whatever because we uh, did this. I'm just going to remove this for now. It's just going to give us annoying compiler errors for now. Uh, we can always slap it on later as a means of validating. Now, so we put it into parser number. This returns a, an int option. So what do I want to do if my option returns none, if my option is none? Well, we want this big thing to return a domain error. And right now it returns an option. So what we can do is we can map the error. We want a function to replace, to we want to create a new result based on a, an option and give it a, a failure value. So we can do a, a standard method library for that or a, or a standard uh, result module with that function that we want. So we can go module result and we can add the required qualify access for these highly generic methods and we want to do a method that takes an option and returns a result. If it's successful, it will take the value from the successful path of the option and put it in the successful path of the result. And if it's a failure, we want to give it a, an error case and give it an error value, a default error value. So we can do let from option. It can take an error value and it will take an option, but we'll pattern match on it. So if it's sum x, then return OK x. All right, so that looks good. But if it's none, then return error of error value. So it takes an A and a B option and returns a result of B of A. That's exactly what we want. So here I can go back and do parse number and then I can combine this with result dot from option and the error value will be um, what will the error value be? Well the error case we know is going to be the parser error It's going to be not a number. So we can do not a number and we can give it input. And maybe we can surround all this. Okay, now this works. This tells me that it'll return a result of in parser error. Okay, so that's fine for now, but you see there's a lot of noise here. So what we can do is we can create a an inner let function. So we can it can just breathe a bit easier. We can do let parse number. Oh, it says parser number. I want parse number. And we can shadow that definition. So we can create a new definition and give it the same name and just change it a little bit. Uh, you'll see the difference. The difference between that and adding prime is very minimal. Um, again, we should use this sparingly if it makes sense. In this case, I feel it makes sense. So I'm going to go ahead and do parser number. And that will be equal to or parse number, and I'll take an input. And basically I'll do input, I'll basically do this, almost. So here we're doing parse number, but instead of doing the combination, I'm just going to do the pipe. And here we have something there. Now the reason I put it in a different method, I want this main function to be a railroad, a railroad, basically. I want to be a railroad of successful case and error. And the type of error I want is domain error. So I don't want the type of the pipeline or the, the, the chaining of the pipe functions to have different types and stuff. It just makes it a lot harder to read because it just, it varies. And if it stays a result type, it just makes it easier to read. 
So that's why I'm abstracting, um, I'm extracting it to a different function. And I'll actually do the same thing. So I can go here and do parse number. Great. Now I can actually do the same thing here with validate number. It's gonna be very similar. So with validate number, I'm going to pipe that in to validate number, oh, validate number. It returns an option and from that option, I want to return I want actually I don't want an option I want an error case and I want the error to be I've added here invalid number so we can do invalid number here of number great now I can go ahead and I can pipe it here validate number we see there's an error of course because parse number returns a result and now I don't have, I only want to call validate number if the result is okay. I don't want to uh, call this function and if, it's, if it's not. So I can go here and do result.bind. It was at this moment Jackson knew. Uh, I'm expecting a result number of parser error, but I'm giving a int of validator error. So here, I for what I forgot to do is I'm supposed to create a domain. This is supposed to return a domain error, basically. And to do that, I have a parser error and I need to give it. So I have this right now, it returns this, but I want to return this type. So I have to pass it into this constructor case. And we can do that. So we can do result dot map error. And I'll do parser error. Great. So I can actually do the same thing here. And I'll give me validate. Uh, I'll, I'll do validate error, validator error. Good. Now these are happy. That's good. Now when we have those two functions, the last thing we want to do is we want to use the valid number result and we want to give it to the get fizzbuzz string. And so here what we can do is since the get fizzbuzz doesn't have an error case, it, it cannot fail. It, it cannot fail because it takes a valid number and returns a string and all cases are successful. So instead of doing bind, we do map because we want to map the function, the want to map the successful value to a another a value of another type, but it cannot fail. It's a result can cannot fail, so we use map. And we're gonna map it to get fizzbuzz string. Cool. And to validate that everything is like we want it to be, we're going to give uh, this the type annotation and everything passed successfully. So here we clearly modeled how each of these functions are little pipelines, right? They're little pipelines going from data to data. Option, option, result, error. And we combine this into this high level. I also want to mention that this is the, the way I like to structure my, my methods that have dependencies to be injected. Here, uh, it, it clearly shows I have these three dependencies and when I inject those three dependencies, I get a new function that takes an input. I get a, like a, a function that, you know, it, it, I don't see its dependencies in the signature, I can just go ahead and use it. Now that we've done our, our domain layer, our domain, our domain level uh, of the services, right? We, we modeled how the, the, the service will look like. We have a clear definition in the execute workflow. Now we want to do the application layer. And the application layer is 
we're going to use the the domain but now we're going much more specific into the use case that we want the use case that we want is we want to print out specific numbers or sorry we have specific error messages that we want to give to the user for certain certain circumstances and we're not at the level of the infrastructure yet so we, we're not going to depict how data is going to be delivered to the use case or how it's going to go out we, we just know that there's a certain input mechanism there's a separate output mechanism and we're going to use those input and output mechanisms to deliver messages to deliver uh, in this case messages they're not like in the functional paradigm messages message passing but there are strings that we're going to show to the screen so I'm going to create a new module. Module application. And this is also where we're going to inject the dependencies here. So here we have no knowledge of the these functions. We have no knowledge of their implementations for now. It has it doesn't know what the implementations are. It knows their type signature. So the equivalent of interfaces, or basically functional interfaces, but we have no idea of what the implementation is. So in the application layer, we're going to inject uh, the proper dependencies to that domain execute function, and we're gonna still have abstracted out the input output mechanism, but basically those dependencies will be injected and the use case or the, the requirements will be filled out here. So we can go ahead and do an execute, let execute function. So we can take in an input and output. We can go ahead and define the types if we want, or we can leave it as is. Right now we can, we'll just leave it as is for now. We can also define this function here in terms of this. So we can go ahead and say that execute or or maybe I should say this execute is equal to or execute the application is actually equal to the domain execute and we can pass it its dependencies now so its dependencies are the parser is parser dot try parse the validator is validator dot valid number dot is valid number and the fizzbuzz algorithm is fizzbuzz dot fizzbuzz get string so this is equal to the execute domain fizzbuzz workflow so now we have it and it's injected with all its it, it's all the the modules or all the units that we want to use now I realize we haven't tested anything so uh, this might be a good time to test each of the modules since we're gluing it all together. Ideally, we wanted to done this beforehand. It kind of got carried away. So we can create a script file. And we can use the F# -sharp interactive to test our data. So if you use a script file and do you know tests, obviously it's not real tests in the in the true sense of the word, but they are just a quick way to test our, our logic and to see if it works. And we can translate those tests into real test cases later with unit tests. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to load the file. I'm going to load the library file. Now I need to surround these. And the first thing I can do is I can test the parsing logic. So the parsing logic is parser dot uh, try parse, right? And I should probably open the fizzbuzz namespace. Now I can try parse. Let's try to parse two. And we can go ahead and, and run all this. Option sum two, great. Let's try to parse tomato. None, great, so that works. Good, let's do the validator now. And actually I'm gonna open validator here kind of annoying to do. So if I do valid number, that is valid number. If I pass it 
five. It should be a valid number. So yes, it says some valid number five, great. If it's zero, oh, I wanna keep the cases because if I wanna test it again, I can just go ahead and do that. So if I can do zero, it's none, great. Because it's not a valid number. If I wanna do 4,500, it's none, great. So now we can rapidly test a few of the test cases here. And I can do fizzbuzz. I actually have to do the valid number first because it takes a valid number. So if I go ahead and here and do valid number five, I can do valid number five and then do option.bind or option.map I should say because uh, fizzbuzz can't fail. If I do this, I should get a string that's one, two, fizzbuzz five. So if I can do 20, I can get all the the possible error cases or all the possible cases because we'll get at least one fizzbuzz. Great. So one, some one, two, blah, 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 blah. okay, good. Awesome. So here we just rapidly tested what we what we were expecting. For regression, of course, every time you push a commit and all that stuff, you, you still want automated unit tests. If we go back here, now we have our injected execute function. We can go ahead and do another function with... Uh, so now we're actually ready to do our, our application. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do a, a, a method that's called let application. It's going to take an input and an output. Okay, now what we're going to do with that? We're actually going to write out the, the workflow. So at first, we take the input, uh, the output, sorry, and we write a message, right? We do, please enter a number between one and 4,000. Next thing we do is we get the input here. So we do let input is equal to, well, actually I can't call it input, input value. And it's equal to input and we call it with unit, right? So we give unit because it's an impure function and I'm gonna get an input value. With that input value, I, and actually I can go ahead and do, I can pipe it into execute. This will give me a string. It will give me a result of domain error and string. And actually you see here, this is kind of awkward domain error. So what we can actually do is we can remove the word domain because it's in the domain namespace, right? So we can do domain dot error instead of domain dot domain error. Now that we've piped the input into the execute function, this will give us our actual return value that we want. So it, it's a result type, so we can pattern match on it. So we can do function if it's okay of s, which is the fizzbuzz string, we can do output um, actually we will have to do some string interpolation here and since output is not it's not the same thing as the console uh, we can do s printf here is the output, do two dots, new line, and then we can do percentage s, and we can put our string there, and then with that, we can pipe it into the output. Great, so that gives us unit, which is what we want. And now to handle the error, uh, I can just go ahead and do it directly here. But before I do that, I'm actually gonna open the domain uh, namespace, simply because it's gonna be less confusing 
Uh, I have a lot of stuff that is named uh, the same. You'll see here. So if I have an error of, and then I'm going to directly write my cases here. So error here represents the result error. And if the case is that I have a parser error, and here this is a union case of the type domain.error, and I only have one case, which is not a number, s, if this is a case, what I want to write is, I can go ahead and do s printf, percentage s is not a valid number, uh, sorry, is not a, is not an integer, is not an integer, and I could pass it s, which is the input, and I can give this result to the output. So I'll put it on the screen or whatever mechanism is being passed to me. And the other case of error is the validator error or validation error, validator error. And the validator error, there's only one case, so we can go ahead and deconstruct it here. It is an invalid number. Call it num, and we can do the same thing. We can do sprintf. We can do percentage i, or you entered percentage i, enter a valid integer between one and four thousand. We can give it num, and we can output it. That's good. And that's basically all we need to do for this workflow. This workflow is not pure, so we have to give it the unit so we can execute. It has to say that this is deterministic and there's side effects. So we have to do that. And now our function signature is looking pretty good, but this input and output, basically we're gonna expose this through our DLL. Someone else can, can reference it. And it would be a good practice to have harder types for these. So we can go ahead and do type abbreviations here. So type input is equal to, you give it unit and it will return a string. And we can do the same thing for output. Output is equal to, you give it a string and it will return unit because there's gonna be a side effect. Great, now we can annotate both of these. And we can do the same for output. Great. So now we, we have a function that takes an input and output as dependencies and returns a function that takes an, a unit that returns a unit. So in this case, the way I like to write it, if I have a function that takes dependencies they'll be injected at a different time and then executed. What I like to do is I actually like to remove this and return a function that takes units. So all this workflow here, so I'm gonna call it workflow. You could call it inner if you want, but I'm just gonna call it workflow. This is equal to that. So this is a function that takes unit. I can just go ahead and do fun unit is equal to this. So this documents that I have two dependencies, which is input and output. And once you give those dependencies, it returns a function that takes unit and returns unit. So I, I really prefer this, this uh, way to document what, what the function does. And of course you could refactor this into its own function. I think it's fine. It's at the, the good level of concern anyways. So. Uh, that's fine by me. And that's basically it for this common library. What we can do is we can create a new project for the command line interface, which is basically like our infra infrastructure in this or infrastructure or presentation layer, if you want. Uh, so we can go ahead and create a new project. Whoop. And we can call it fizzbuzz.cli. And it's a console application. 
and we add we have to add a dependency uh, to the common library we just made so we can add a reference to this great once we add that reference we can go ahead and do application in fizzbuzz dot application we could have called it execute or something but I just did this for now and we can call it console read line for the input it takes an input and an output so we can do console read line then we can do console write line great and this returns a function and we just have to give it unit unit to execute great we we did it so if we go ahead and do i'll just exit this out and do another one great so if i do cd dot dot fizzbuzz dot cli and i go dot net run to run this console application execute the three main use cases we did so the first one is we just do a random string so we'll go tomato tomato is not an integer that's what we want great the next thing we can do is test a valid integer but not between this range so we can go zero you entered zero please enter a valid integer that's great and the last use case is a valid number so let's go 100 and let's see if I can zoom this in we get a valid output 15 16 17 yeah so this is valid that's great that's exactly what we want all right so that's going to be the end of this video uh, we're going to cover unit tests in another separate video when I can fully explain all there is to explain about unit testing in F sharp there's a lot to cover and I feel uh, I actually started writing the unit tests and I feel I was going too fast and there's a lot of stuff I was skipping so I'm going to keep it for another video and uh, this will be the end of this one and the next one we're going to compare this implementation with a C sharp implementation and we're going to analyze what are the pros and cons to both implementations so that's going to be a lot of fun uh, if you enjoyed this video make sure to give me a like and subscribe to be notified for all future videos which will be a lot more coming in the future so thanks again and I'll see you next one